It's season nine's Halloween episode, and there's a storm a brewing. Here comes Treble. Hey, everybody, I'm Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today we are looking at Here Comes Treble. This episode is cluttered and messy and filled to the brim with cringe, intrigue, and a couple of laughs, and at least one major chunk of theory bait. It's Halloween. That is really, really good timing. Let's go. I understand nothing. First thing we have to acknowledge with Here Comes Trouble is that it presents a lot of mental health type topics. Things ranging from anxiety and medication, financial and marital problems, and Andy's questioning some pretty heavy things with his personal identity. I don't know who I am. All that to say that Here Comes Treble is a pretty trouble-filled episode with a lot of heavy themes, far-reaching character reveals, and some long-standing consequences. And it's kind of crazy that BetterHelp is the sponsor of today's video. They reached out a few weeks ago to see if I was interested in an integration, and I was like, Hell yeah. Look, sometimes life is tough, and while TV can be therapy, and sometimes our friends can be good sounding boards for our stuff, Sometimes it's good to talk and just be listened to someone who actually can help. And BetterHelp is perfect for someone like me who'd rather cut my toes off than go through all the extroverted work to, you know, find a good fit in real life. Because with BetterHelp, most of it's online. You just fill out a questionnaire and the app matches you with a therapist pretty quickly. They say usually within 48 hours, I was matched with someone in just four hours. You could divulge as much or as little as you want on that app like your ideologies, your struggles, your religious preferences, all that kind of stuff, and they match you with someone qualified. And if you get stuck with a Toby, you can just move on. No harm, no foul. You just opt for another therapist. But if that's something you're interested in checking out, all you have to do is go to their site. You can use my link, betterhelp.com slash Mulverine, or you can choose Mulverine during sign up, and you can get that sweet discount for your first month. Sessions are all digital, so you can talk on the phone, computer, video call, messaging, whatever you feel most comfortable with and that you think would be most beneficial for you. We're all unique butterflies. Link and all that is in the description. Thanks again, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this video. He's just having a tough time being wifeless and a high-pressure job and his crazy cousin Moe's other cousin Moe's. Mm. Okay, so our cold opening today is doing some heavy lifting, and it's the pumpkin Dwight one. Our writers are establishing that this is a Halloween episode, doing some physical comedy along the way, but also setting up this theme in the episode of play stupid games, get stupid prizes. I never should have played that joke on Aaron. No. But it's not only a look at what happens when we're left to our own devices, there is a serious look at the ways we try to exit these situations we find ourselves in, sometimes healthily and sometimes not. Try destroying the pumpkin. Yeah. No, 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 no. But as Jim and I discovered, not everybody is good for us. <laughs> Gotta dodge the bullet on that one. Also, I love in this, Dwight goes through like all six stages of grief denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The pumpkin should rot off of my head in a month or two, right? But Here Comes Treble is about so much more than Rain Wilson struggling to pretend to not be able to take off this fake pumpkin. It's also about Andy trying to relive some of his glory days. Red, gold, and green. Come on, come on. Ah! So good. And since it's Halloween, let's do a quick rundown of the costumes. What the hell is a rundown? Andy is Adam Lambert. I'm dressed like George Michael. I thought you were Adam Lambert. <laughs> Pam is Doc Cinderella. I'm an oncologist. Jim is a nerd. Shut up. <laughs> Kevin is Charlie Brown. Stanley is Usain Bolt, I think. Dwight, I just thought he was a pig for the longest time, but I guess he's someone named Cerebus, the aardvark. Daryl is repurposing that cowboy outfit from season seven. Meredith is sporting that MCU Black Widow costume. Angela is maybe herself from the fundraiser episode, but also Nancy Reagan, probably. Oscar is political commentary. Aaron's a puppy. Phyllis is a cheerleader. Nellie is sexy Toby. Toby is sexy Toby. Pete Clark and Creed did not dress up. I didn't realize that everybody here dresses up every year. Me neither. It's Halloween. That is really, really good timing. So the drama of this setup is actually pretty neatly and tightly written for this opening sequence. Obviously, Andy is going through some things. 
bringing the acapella group in to do a concert today for their Halloween party. Body language would suggest that Pam is still harboring a little bitterness about Jim's hidden but now exposed business venture. And Jim is just over the moon to be able to go be a part of this investor meeting. As Jim exits for the meeting, Dwight finds a pill amongst his spilled candy, and thus Detective Cerebus leads yet another investigation around the office. Our paths then separate for a little bit before coming back together. Dwight enlists Nellie to find the culprit, and he likens anyone with anxiety to a madman, which didn't lead him here for some reason. Were you just talking about mental illness by any chance? Nope. Huh? Well, we're going to talk about that later. We are let in on the fact that the pill does belong to Nellie, who goes along with Dwight to keep her medical stuff a secret, because we have seen how Dwight handles medical things in the past. Blink once if you want me to pull the plug. You're not allowing natural selection to do its work. You're like the guy who invented the seatbelt. In the wild, there is no health care. In the wild, health care is, ow, I hurt my leg, I can't run. A lion eats me, and I'm dead. You want to get sick, you go to a hospital. Okay, Dwight. She's... But also, she seems to be looking for ways that she could protect people from Dwight along the way. Meanwhile, at the business meeting, Jim's partners are all notable in their own way. First, we have the guy from Adam Ruins Everything. Then we have Sam Richardson, who's an absolute delight in everything I've seen him in. And then we have Ben Silverman, who I last talked about in the Why Did Steve Carell Leave the Office video, and I never put two and two together that that was this guy. And this guy basically made the office happen. So kudos, glad to put a name to the face, unless I'm not supposed to like him and I'm supposed to hate him now because of some scuzzy Hollywood thing. It's too hard to keep up. I didn't research any of this. It's best to just leave this in as a disclaimer. Maybe I hate him now, but at the, I think at this point, I think I'm, I think I like him. It's all too confusing. Anyway, Jim is scraping by just to make sure that he's injecting himself into the ground level of this business venture, which makes me wonder if like every family of four with two little kids had this much money in 2013 that they could just drop on a business venture. 10,000? Or was it just me that didn't? Maybe it's possible they took some money out of retirement or maybe this is just Hollywood people not knowing how the middle class financials work. Because sometimes I see this stuff in movies and I wonder. Like, where, where would you get all of that money from? But all of that could just be skewed by our current economic hell that we're living in. It, is this a good time to plug the Patreon or like the worst time to plug? Join my Patreon. So he goes all in, not sure exactly why, but probably due to a little insecurity about his shaky start with the company and just wanting to show the guys that he is fully committed. I think the writing is suggesting that because the other guys gave him a way out and they didn't expect him to invest at all. Jim, I explained everything, so you're all set. Jim just goes all in, that maybe this whole thing was a little unwise on Jim's part because it was really altogether unnecessary. But back at the office, I just noticed that Andy is wearing his earring on the gay ear. Are you sure that's not the gay ear? Gay ear? Are you 12 years old? Well, I... But that is not the identity issue that Andy's dealing with. He is struggling, after talking with the Cornell boys, with the fact that maybe his legacy of the good old days is fading away. And if he's not the quote boner champ, then what is he? Andy Bernard is the boner champ. Boner champ, that's me. <laughs> this is very important to understanding Andy. If I am not boner champ, I don't know who I am. Aaron's extremely supporting throughout this entire episode, fighting for her man at every step, and simultaneously getting extremely disillusioned with Andy in real time. When you're with someone, you put up with the stuff that makes you lose respect for them. And that is love. The acapella recital in the conference room serves as an emotional climax for two out of three of the stories in which Jim reveals to Pam that he put in all of their money to the startup. Her reaction is something that we're gonna save for the deeper meaning, but she is not super happy. In spite of the fact that they did talk about that, this was on the upper range of that, she doesn't seem to be exactly upset about the specific amount that Jim put in, but rather that he put in all of the money and he didn't have to. Now this little fight they're having is juxtaposed to the cover of I'll Be, which YouTube will nuke my channel into oblivion if I show a clip of. Throughout all of this, Andy is still trying to get his delicious moment. One mother delicious moment. Which will validate his existence in this universe, 
and the bite he wants here is just to relive the glory days with Here Comes Trouble. Because back then, life probably felt full of possibilities, he was accepted by his peer group, and the world was really open for him, all compared to where he is now. And it's not even here now, because it's all ripped away by Stephen Colbert. I got a bite like you, but I got it twice. Whoa. Before I the overlapping singing stands out, and Andy is hurt by this entire thing. It's pretty clear that Broccoli Rob is the Uncle Rico of the Cornell acapella scene. How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? But Rob's way of dealing with the exact same thing that Andy's currently feeling is to live in his past and remind people as aggressively as necessary that he was, and still is, something special. And he's considering going down this same path, which is absolute foolishness. He wants to go live near Cornell and just be a presence just to retain his former glory. A glory, by the way, which was never actually glorious. I had sex with a snowman. Not sure we needed to know why Andy was called the boner champ, but there we go. All of this pondering of Andy's identity is exacerbated when life throws him one more pretty major curveball. My parents are broke. Later, Dwight traps Meredith with a comically large net, and I do wonder if this is ever going to be elaborated on in the Superfan episodes, or maybe they talked about it in the podcast, but it's probably just a way to pay off this great moment earlier in the office. Dwight and Nellie have a heart-to-heart -heart over the disclosure that she is the owner of the pill and that maybe he should put away some of his antiquated ways of thinking about mental health, which is later fully realized by Dwight, accepting that sometimes anxiety medication isn't the worst thing to consider when you're dealing with a lot of anxiety. Some people also may suggest... Northern Lights Cannabis Indica. <sighs> no. It's marijuana. But that person should be your doctor and not me or a guy with a bloody button up. Not bloody like the British bloody, but like bloody, like, I've been watching too much Ted Lasso. But bloody like this. It's Halloween. That is really, really good timing. I've used this clip so many times in theory videos. So I would just talk about it for a second. Do you think that Creed is just messing with people? Or like, is he supposed to be a stand-in for unchecked anxiety and psychopathy? <laughs> and I should also mention here that the Jim Pam plotline just lingers unresolved, which seems very much on purpose. You have to sing Monster Man. Oh, you have to, Jim? You literally have to. Turns out Pam really, really hates Monster Mash. That's a metaphor. So with that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. Okay, so this episode is dealing with a lot of conflict and mental health stuff like we talked about. All of that stuff is on the surface and the lessons are kind of self-evident. So instead of reanalyzing all of that, Let's just maybe take a look at the current state of mind of our characters in this season spanning arc. So Andy has always struggled with his identity, seeming to want to gain significance from these identity markers like his school, his heritage, his relationship status, or his career status. We've looked at his daddy issues, which have caused a lot of Andy's bizarre behavior. We looked at that back in the Garden Party episode last season. But now we're seeing an Andy who's a bit uninhibited by restraint, which was something purposefully written into this season. I ate a worm. Glad to hear it. You sound really confident and decisive. Andy's back decisive, but he's decisively a douchebag, whose newfound assertiveness just seems to be an excuse for not really caring about other people at all. I had this really funny dream during Outward Bound that you died. Get your wrinkly old balls in here. How are you not murdered every hour? No sand grains you, are tumbling with fury down it's not, the it's steep not entrapment sides if I'm of the hourglass. Writing. Time's up. It's almost like it took off a douche inhibitor and all of this quiet desperation is just bubbling to the surface. That would be insane. Which is not a good trait in a boss or a good trait in a boyfriend. And season nine seems resolute to remove every single thing that the character of Andy Bernard may fall back on. 
And with everything that he's dealing with in this episode, it seems like the planets are aligning for some serious spiraling to occur. I think the next character that I thought was compelling to talk about is Pam, and her vibe in this episode is kind of rough. What's interesting over the last few years, reading and listening to all the dialogue out there about this Philly arc and Pam's place within this arc, there is a heavy focus on episodes like this in which people just can't seem to grasp why Pam is behaving the way that she's behaving. And you may not agree with how she's handling this situation, but Greg Daniels went out of his way to establish exactly why Pam is having the reaction to all of this that she is. I love my boring life. Come on. Exactly the way it is. No, Yes, Pam. and there's nothing you can say that would get me to run the slightest risk of losing it. Look, if you're like me and you live your life a quarter mile at a time, how I wrote, that is something I wrote. Um, <laughs> then it's hard to reason with Pam's logic here because personally, I don't see it. But if you are a planner, we're kind of planners, and you value your security in your plans, well, then this is all a big deal. And it's pretty easy to understand where Pam's coming from. In America, at least, we kind of think of money and the security it brings in a variety of ways. Like Jim is kind of a hippie. He's kind of a dreamer, apparently, this season. So for him... This investment of the money, the risk is worth it because it represents upward mobility in their status and thus improvement to their quality of life. The money will come because he believes in what he's doing. Pam, on the other hand, is consistently shown to be conservative. Not politically that one guy that got really mad at me last week. My pipes are primo, champ. But conservative in the sense that she plays her cards very deliberately and planned. The risk for her does not represent upward mobility like it does for Jim, but instead it represents not being able to deal with whatever life is throwing their way. They won't have the money to handle the curveballs that life throws. And sometimes life throws you curveballs is very much the theme of this episode. My greased up head went into the pumpkin no problem, but it won't budge. I can't get it out. Hello, little pill. What do you do? But I Whoa! Think twice. Whoa! Before I give my heart what the hell is Broccoli Rob doing here? What? My parents are broke. Ten. It was the full ten. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Again, throughout this arc, the writers are trying to suggest that this is not a one-sided fight. This isn't a one-sided issue. While I may not disagree personally with how Pam handles any of these issues, I don't agree with how Jim handled any of this either. You have $10,000 sitting around and they're like, no, you don't have to do that. Don't do it. <laughs> and what I think is most frustrating through the majority of season nine is that for most of these people and most of their problems, if they just, you know, talk about it, they could move forward and figure these things out. But instead, they speak very cryptically and kind of projecting their issues onto other things. The fact that this conflict isn't resolved by the end of this episode is not lazy writing. It's actually... The first time I can think of anything like this happening in a main plotline of The Office. And it seems to suggest that this is going to linger on and maybe only going to get worse from here. It's like Andy's cliffhanger drama bomb is the yin to the Jim and Pam Yang. Dwight's story, though, is a little blah. I don't really think we've established that Dwight is someone who deals with anxiety. But, you know, I guess you don't really know these things. You need to vanquish fear! And this probably was a story that was very near and dear to Rain Wilson's heart based on the mental and spiritual health stuff he seems really big into now. Uh, but that does lead us right into the ratings. This is the worst! This is crap. Oh, I agree, yes. Crap. Continue. The first year I started this channel, I was an admin of an Office Addicts Facebook group. I've talked about this on the channel before. There were hundreds of thousands of people on this Facebook group. And that October, there was this weird viral thing that happened in the group in which thousands, if not tens of thousands of real human beings changed their personal profile picture on Facebook to Pumpkin Dwight Schrute. And the stories would like pour in of loved ones being super confused why their friend or their husband or their son changed their profile picture on Facebook to, you know, a suited man with a pumpkin head and not understanding it was an office reference. And that will forever skew my opinion of this cold opening. It was an exciting and weird time. 
And my love for this cold opening has heightened all the more in analyzing this, seeing all the legwork that it was doing to set up some of the thematic elements for this episode, and really subtly. So I give this one a four out of five. I am not a security threat. But as for the episode, I'm surprised it gets the hate that it does. I think it falls victim to this not being the story that people wanted told. Also, Andy sucks for sure, and him being the focal point of this episode probably does result in some uncritically thought through vitriol that happened after the episode settled. So like people going back a couple of years later from memory saying, oh, here comes trouble. That's the one with Andy's acapella group. I don't like that one. One out of 10. <laughs> This episode is interesting to me because in some ways it captures the old vibe of The Office, dealing with a taboo topic like mental health and some of these kind of heavy emotional conflicts and showing it in a way that both feels real and also larger than life. And while the stress relief effect is obvious and almost inseparable from the series now, I found a lot of depth in this episode, which I found meaningful and I also think it helps with future reads of these characters' motives, things I hadn't even noticed up until now. So all up, I'm giving this one a three out of five. Oh yeah, I decided acapella music is awesome. But that's just what I think about Here Comes Trouble. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thanks to all the patrons supporting the channel. Check out BetterHelp if that's your thing. Use that link or the promo code and, you know, get 10% off. That's awesome. And we'll see you next week for the field guide on the boat, which I feel like I sigh every episode now. <clears throat> Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.